strength training is going to not only help your athletes perform better, but it's going to help them become more injury resilient and all these things that coaches want their athletes to be able to do on the field. Strength training will only enhance it. The most unhealthy thing for like your shoulder, as an example, is like actually throwing a baseball hundred miles an hour. This is our first chance to chat, but you know, Mr. Bill Miller over here, author of Swing Fast, bought his book. You know, where can where can people find this, Mr. Bill? You can find it over on Amazon. And uh, if for some reason Amazon has been giving people problems lately with deliveries, mm-hmm. if you're having problems with Amazon, I have a ton of books right here in my office. So just reach out to me directly on Instagram, DM at Bill Miller Training, and I can hook you up with a book if need be. There you go. There's the plug. And then uh, obviously I'll put his stuff down below too. So if you guys need to, but today we're going to talk about a lot of throwing power, increasing rotational power, increasing exit velocity for like swinging. Doesn't like, obviously we're talking a bit more baseball, softball type of type of talk, but obviously the same principles again are sound and they apply to whether you want to increase your golf swing, which Bill's over here crushing like heads off golf clubs and stuff I've seen on Instagram. So it's about increasing rotational power, increased throwing velocity, preparing your body, you know, strength training, all that stuff for baseball, softball, all this stuff. Kind of started with like the front of your book. So big thing right in the beginning that I liked that kind of grabs people's attention was like, it talks about the increase in throwing speed or like the, I believe it was a baseball player's exit velocity. And Basically, the higher the velocity was, the higher levels they made it through baseball. Is that kind of right? A hundred percent. Yeah. And so if you were to break it down on a baseball field, I don't have the numbers in front of me exactly. But if you go from like an 85 mile per hour exit velocity hit in a major league game, Mm -hmm. the chances of you getting a hit or being successful are real, real small. Like you're hitting like 0.100 with that uh, that 85 exit velocity, but you increase it five miles per hour. Now, all of a sudden, you're hitting 250. So you have a one out of four chance of getting a hit just by hitting a ball five miles per hour harder. And then you go up another five or six miles per hour, and the batting average skyrockets. Now you have a really good chance of getting a hit. So now, all of a sudden, not only do you have a better chance of hitting home runs and doubles and things that people want to argue about, it's bad for baseball that all these guys are hitting home runs now. We're talking about actual success as a hitter. We're talking about getting hits. And, and helping your offense. So just by hitting balls harder and giving your body the ability to hit balls harder on average, now you're looking at better outcomes. And all you have to do is look at who are the best players in the major leagues, who are the best players at the college level, who are the best players at the high school level. Nine times out of 10, they're going to be the guys who hit the ball the hardest, most consistently. Mm-hmm. So if you want to have the ability to hit balls harder, more consistently, you have to make your body more powerful. You have to make your swing more powerful. And that's how you're going to impact your game. And that's what we're going to dive into. How do you increase your, you know, how do you hit harder? Obviously we're marrying the two of like, you need the potential. You need to have that potential to hit the ball hard, obviously, because if you have the potential in your weight room animal, right. But then you suck at the technical skill of, of hitting, obviously that's not going to work out well. So you got to do both. You got to do the preparation and the, and the skill. And so like, I guess we'll, since we're kind of on that segue. So why do we think that is that like, why do you think there's a correlation potentially that when you do hit the ball harder, then it, it more likely um, results in getting like on base percentage or getting a hit, whatever it is. So why do you, why do you feel like that is like it's correlated? There's definitely like, you just have to look at the defense of, of the game. Like if I'm a defender and I have a 85 mile per ball hit in my range, I have more time to get to it. If I have a ball that's hit at a hundred miles per hour, I, I have a much uh, lower time frame to try to get to that ball. So you're just looking at, at, difficulty making it harder on the defense to make a play on you and i don't know if you watch the chicago cubs play you got like javier baez is making these crazy diving catches and stuff like that you know you play any good team their defense is probably going to be really really good so if you want to be successful against those types of players you have to be able to hit balls harder to where they can't catch it. I am, am going to be 100% honest i'm probably not the best person to talk to when it comes to throwing mechanics, swinging mechanics, and things like that. The area that I really like to dive into, though, is like the how to marry the strength and conditioning side of things to the power that we see out in the field. So you had kind of mentioned it before, like, you know, you could be big and strong in the weight room, but it might not transfer over to the field. That was exactly me as a player. So I played uh, like up to like independent ball. 
And I'm playing with some of these guys who maybe they got released from the minor leagues and stuff like that, but they were still really good players. They're like 40, 50 pounds smaller than me. I could outlift, out bench every single one of them in the weight room, but they're hitting balls a lot farther than me. They are throwing balls faster than me. That's the sport that we play. We don't play bench press and hand clean and deadlift. We play throw a baseball and swing a two pound bat. Why are these guys applying force at high speeds so much better than me? And something that I've started to come across in just training and tracking metrics is like that high velocity power, that, that medicine ball throw velocity or the plyometrics. Those were the exercises that I really sucked at. Like I was terrible at those and I'm still not very good at them. We want to make sure that that bench press is transferring to an improved in medicine ball, chest pass, distance, or velocity, something like that. That's how you start to get the ball rolling to make sure that all of your strength training is actually transferring to that high velocity power. I almost think of this as a weird analogy, but like almost like your exercises evolve. Like obviously, like we're saying in the, in the off season, like as soon as baseball shuts down, we focus a lot more on just the general exercises, of course. And then as we move towards, you know, baseball season tryouts, you want to make sure that those exercises evolve and and get more specific to the motion. So such as baseball in this example, let's say you're doing pull-ups in the very beginning, you know, phases. And then, but like you're saying that pull-up now turns into like a, a pull-over, um, not just with like, you know, not just with a band, but then it turns into a medicine ball. And then that way it's just doing those muscles at a higher velocity, same types of motions, but at a more specific manner, which is throwing a baseball. Yeah. Um, so like, yeah. So it's cool just to try to hopefully clarify in case anybody had any questions. So like you're talking about, obviously we need to ha take our training and it needs to be more velocity specific. So I believe in your situation, you're referring to, you were, you got the strength down path. Like you like, I crushed, mm -hmm. the, you know, I lift things up, I put things down, but it's not transferring. So the missing link for you was like taking that heavy strength training, now converting it into power with the plyometrics and medicine ball throws and all this other stuff. I feel like a lot of kids, again, I don't know, you can tell me about your experience, but a lot of kids never, most of the kids I see, like probably like 80, 90% of them, like high school kids, they never even get the strength part, right? So like Bill had this part down, but most kids never even have the potential, you know, or they have a good potential to work with to convert to that higher velocity power type of stuff. So let's talk about maybe real quick, a couple of things that you see, unless you want to go a different direction. Um, like just with high school kids, like the lowest hanging fruit that you often see when kids come into your door and that you try, you train, you hit the nail on the head, like high school kids, 99% of the time are going to be what I call force deficient. So you can do these uh, force velocity profiles, a real simple one that I outline in the book pretty detailed is mm -hmm. um, you can do a sitting or lying on your back overhead throw, and you can do a kneeling chest pass with three or four different medicine ball weights, a really, really heavy medicine ball for sure. A ball in the middle, say like a 10 pound at the heavy and a six pound in the middle, and then a really lightweight ball, like a two pound ball. Mm -hmm. So if you're more force deficient, then that means you would struggle with that 10 pound, that heavier ball. They won't throw it very far or very hard. And then when it gets to the lighter ball, they'll probably throw it pretty hard. They'll probably do pretty well. Whereas if you're somebody who's velocity deficient like myself, I'm going to throw that 10 pound ball really far, really hard. But then when it gets to the 10 pound ball, there's not a huge increase. So now if you were to plot these on a graph, on a force velocity profile graph, you're going to see more force deficient guys have very vertical graphs, very big differences between the balls. And you're going to see guys like myself who are velocity deficient have a much more horizontal graph where there's not a huge jump especially at that velocity end of the spectrum. So if you wanted to just test your guy to see if, if you're not sure if they need that strength training or, or a high volume of that strength training, just take them through a force velocity profile like that. And that will show you what's happening um, and how they produce force. So moving on from that, then you say, okay, with this force velocity profile, it says that this guy is force deficient. Most high school athletes are. Most of their program is going to be heavy strength training. We're going to do heavy pressing. We're going to do heavy pulling, stuff like that. And then maybe we'll have a little bit of medicine ball slams and chest pass, just enough to make sure that they are expressing that, that high velocity strength, if you will. So moving on from that, then maybe three weeks later, we're going to retest that force velocity profile again and see what happened. That's really where strength training should be going, in my opinion. Like the future of strength training is not so much coming up with these elaborate plans for months on end. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's micro cycles. Like 
you come up with a plan for the next three weeks that you think is going to work. And then you retest and see what happened and say, oh, this is working. The entire force velocity profile is shifting upwards. The velocity end is going up and the force end is going up. That's what we want. Or if you're somebody who's velocity deficient like myself, you say, oh, we need that velocity end to go up. Okay, it went up at the end of the three weeks. We're just going to repeat a similar cycle or maybe expand on it a little bit. But that's the idea that I like to try to get across to people is it's not always about having the perfect program. It's about having perfect testing for your program to get you going in the right direction all the time. So I don't know about you, but I kind of picked up that um, thought process, me personally, from like Cal Dietz's stuff. So like he would like, you mm -hmm. know, like every three weeks test. Um, but at the same time, like just from a logistics standpoint, a practicality standpoint, maybe you run into, you know, being in the private sector too, is like kids potentially being inconsistent with their workouts. So like, what's the point of retesting if you're not consistent with your program? You know what I mean? Because it's going to skew the mm -hmm. results. So it's like, you might as well just you do the same program if, you know, if, if you haven't been consistent with it. And then too, like, has it been like, um, is it very time intensive to run these force velocity profiles or like getting the kids to even execute the things? Or so do you do this with like more of your high end guys or do it with every program, like even like beginners, because, you know, maybe there's some obstacles that run in the way. Yeah, you, you hit a very good point. When it comes to beginners, I would say anybody under the age of 16, you probably don't have to worry about force velocity profiling them. Like you can probably just maybe have them test like a medicine ball throw once a month, like just to see that, that it's improving, mm -hmm. which it should be improving. Like most of those beginners, if you just have them attack weight training with their maximal effort, their maximal intensity with great technique, if you can find a way to get them to do that, they're going to see gains. Like that's just what happens. But I would say maybe after age 16, 17, then you can start adding in more of that complex style of uh, approach to training where we're doing the a lot more consistent testing and stuff like that. And from what I've found, a great way to do it is try to have maybe three or four guys testing on the same day. That really makes my job easier because now we can get all the testing done in 15 or 20 minutes for three or four different guys. So we're knocking out a lot of birds with one stone, but we're also creating like sort of a competitive environment. And that's really, really nice. It's like the competitive environment is, is, huge for training in my opinion like it gets the most out of whatever that guy can that day and it keeps them accountable like hey if you've been sleeping like crap all week long going out with your buddies or you've been slacking on your strength training the last couple of weeks it's going to show up in the testing so you would better bring your best and you had better be consistent with your training and your sleep and your nutrition to make sure that the next time you test it's going to be really good 100 as a coach it makes your job easier and then like the kids get better results it's a win-win because it's like your job as a coach, like once you, once you give them information, like you want to let them run with it and crush it. Right. And like get out of the way and just create that environment where guys are having fun and competing and high fiving and, you know, talking smack and all the other stuff to get the most out of each other, obviously in a, in a loving way, turn the music on, let's get to work. As far as what the specific tests that we have are, you know, obviously like if you want to increase baseball throwing velocity or batting exit velocity, you have to test that specific metric. Like I'm, 100% in like you have to throw a baseball if you want to throw harder, especially if you're past that age of like 16, 17, those beginner gains are gone. You got to throw if you want to throw harder. But the tests that I like from a strength and conditioning perspective are the medicine ball shot, put throw. So kind of like a rotational throw like that, an overhead throw works really, really well. And sort of a rotational scoop toss where you're like from the hip side toss into the radar gun. You can do these for distance as well, but the the way I've tried to look at it, I'm not sure if you're uh, if you're familiar with Chris Beardsley of Strength and Conditioning Research at all. I've worked with him a lot, and the one thing that he really helped me with was looking at the kinetic sequence of the throw or the swing, and kind of pick up on what muscle groups really have to produce force at high speed. Which ones are the accelerators for the movement? And then he calls the other group, the decelerator muscles, those ones that really have to resist. Looking at it like that, you say, okay, we know that the pec and the lats and the hip extensors have to be very powerful and very explosive in the throw and in the swing. So we want to test those to make sure that they're producing that force at really high speeds. We really can't test those, but we're going to want to get them strong as hell. Like, Rowing, in my opinion, should be in every single baseball player's program because it's training those decelerators to be super strong and super stable. And exercises like that, those strength training exercises, deadlifting, 
is another great one to work on that, that posterior chain to make sure that it's really strong and ready to help transfer energy up the chain as well. So the tests that I like to do kind of match up with whatever you see in the kinetic sequence of the movement. So yeah, like uh, like they're saying, well, like, especially for the pitchers or as, as an example, like you know, when they have to do in that lead leg, that, that front leg needs to, to decelerate and stabilize all that acceleration <laughs> back leg driving to the driving off the mound to the to home plate as an example just backtracking very briefly on the force velocity profiling and also training for the different age groups because most of you know a lot of kids we do are like that 16 ish age range so it's like because a lot of parents come in and they need to see baseball throwing right they need to see a medicine ball slam or something that they think or perceive as is going to be baseball specific and transfer so it's like they have this hard time sometimes or maybe just questions and education around how does general exercises improve my baseball performance. So basically what you were kind of implying though, if I'm right, is like if they're under 16, essentially just focus on the general exercises, such as push-ups, bench press, dumbbell bench press, uh, squats, lunges, deadlifts, all those non-specific baseball exercises. They really are specific. You and I know that because they're going to transfer over, but maybe how how do you feel that those help transfer over, you know, for those younger age groups for the, cause I feel like I run into that question a lot with parents. Yeah. It, it is a tough one to try to get it across to them. You know what I, what I do, honestly, like I will have them go through their warm up, you know, dynamic warm up and everything. And then we will do some specific looking things right at the very like end of the warm up before we start the weight training. So we're going to run some sprints. We're going to do maybe some med ball slams and some chest passes. We might even do some rotational throws too. I like including it in the warm up. One, because it increases their intent. Like, all right, wake your ass up. We are going to move fast today. We are going to be really forceful today. Like that's important. I think when, when it comes to training those younger groups. So beyond that, just trying to generally like explain, Hey, this style of training works. All you got to do, like I know for a strength and conditioning coaches, most of them don't really dive into the baseball realm, but I'm very fortunate. I can test uh, batting exit velocity pretty much every month if I wanted to. And if I have a kid who started off goblet squatting a 20 pound dumbbell, and by the end of the month, they're goblet squatting a 45 or 50 pound dumbbell, and they're doing all these other things, like they added 10 reps to their push-ups or whatever, and their exit velo went up two miles per hour, you say, hey, look, there's correlation here. We are, we're not even throwing medicine balls that much. We're not doing anything that looks like a swing, but we're increasing the swing's power. That's what matters. These two kids come in, they're two brothers. Anyways, they're like maybe like nine and like, or 10 and eight-ish, you know what I mean? But they also play at a high level. And like, so when they had their parents come in and say, hey, you know, his his exit velocity is up like, you know, two, three miles an hour. And he's like, you know, they attribute it to what we're doing. Like, that's the best news that I hear. And I'm excited. And more important to me that they they see that and they understand it and they appreciate it. So again, some of the consistent guys too, then those are the ones that get results even at such a young age. And they're not doing anything mm -hmm. crazy. You know, some med ball chest passes with each other and lunges and squats and you know, keep it simple. Greg Rose of uh, TPI. I think it's on base. You now, I'm not sure who he's with. He worked with Rory McElroy when Rory was a 14 and 15 year old kid, just this scrawny little kid who was rotating super, super fast, hitting balls like, like a PGA tour driver would, but he was so skinny and weak. He was running himself into really bad back problems and rib cage problems and stuff like that. So your kid might rotate extremely fast, extremely efficiently. He might leap at this over the next two, three years if he just keeps swinging and rotating super fast, but eventually it's going to catch up to him. We want to lay the foundation and lay the base so that he's not getting hurt at age 14, 15, 16. We want to make sure that his body is ready to handle all of that really fast rotation that he's going to be doing in the future. Like so many people want to fast forward progress. You can't fast forward progress. You have to go through the levels. So that's a great segue too, because I believe in your book, you almost have like little landmarks. And I feel like that works very well with athletes of knowing like standards. As an example, when do we know that we should take our heavy strength training focus and start to transfer it a little bit more to velocity specifics. Obviously, like we touched you on any good program, I believe, is like we don't just do strictly all like kind of strength training. We'll still have the the high velocity stuff in there, like messing ball throws or different versions. But so like, you know, when my deadlift is like, you know, 1.5 times my body weight or my I can bench press, you know, 1.5 or two times my body weight. So like, what are some good markers that, you know, parents or kids want to know 
to start transferring to or maybe switching the exercise to more velocity specific. Yeah. And, and like I said before, like it all comes down to that force velocity profile. Like I'm really big on that first, but um, I would say benchmarks for, for weight training exercises. If you can't deadlift twice your body weight, you probably will see good results just by increasing your deadlift. Like that it's a pretty low standard to be able to hit. In my opinion, like it's it, like if, I'm 220 pounds. So 450 pounds is a big deal. Like you should be able to pull that though. It's not so much that you have to have the biggest deadlift in the world, but it's gotta be pretty damn good. Like until you reach that point or it's gotta be pretty good so that you reach the point in which strength training will lead to diminishing returns. You want to get the most out of your strength training, the most until you reach that point of diminishing returns for that point of diminishing returns to happen though. It's going to have to be like, at least two times your body weight in the deadlift. I would say at least 1.5 times your body weight in the bench press. For baseball players, though, it gets a little tricky because most guys really suck at bench pressing in baseball. So I would say if, if you can't bench press 200 pounds, probably you need to increase your bench press a little bit. If you can't deadlift 400 to 450 pounds, you probably need to increase your deadlift. Reverse lunge is another one that I'm really, really big on. Not sure if you know of Dr. Josh Heenan, but He's big on that. I don't know so much if it has to be a percent of the body weight, but if you can't reverse lunge two plates, 225 pounds, you're probably going to see good results just by attacking that. So that's the, the, the sort of standards, I guess I would put, but it really all comes down to when are you reaching diminishing returns? And if you're consistently testing medicine ball, throw velocity, plyometric jump performance and stuff like that, that will show you when, oh, my deadlift went up by 10 pounds this month but I'm not jumping any higher. Okay. Yeah. You went from 450 to 460 this month in the deadlift. Maybe you're reaching that point of diminishing returns. So we'll try to add in a lot more high speed power type exercises. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah. Like you're saying, just doing those like three week adjustment cycles makes it probably more fun for you as a coach too. You know what I mean? Cause like, you know, it's like new exercises and you can kind of like, so you have your finger on the pulse of what, what's going on with the training with the guys and you can make your best call. I guess one question I did get on Instagram yesterday is what are some good at home workouts or exercises that uh, you can increase exit velocity? So obviously exit velocity, mainly swinging power, essentially. So I guess what are some things you could do potentially with minimal equipment um, kids can do at home type of thing? Maybe a couple of favorite exercises of yours that you might give to your guys. So the biggest issue that I've come across with at home training is how difficult it is to create external feedback, you know, create some sort of performance aspect to training. So the one exercise that I like a lot for the lower body is a broad jump for distance or a single leg broad jump for distance. Just see how far you can jump, mark it, and then try to improve on that distance over the course of your program, however long you are at home. So I would say that's a really good one because it actually shows you um, what might be happening with your lower body power. One that requires minimal equipment, that's a really good strength exercise that I love is the Nordic hamstring curl. All you have to do is fit your feet underneath a couch, underneath something heavy enough to hold your body weight, and then just perform the Nordic hamstring curl as slow as you possibly can all the way down. If you can go all the way down and up like Tyree Kill, that's awesome. But I love Nordic hamstring curls. There's so much bang for your buck there, and it requires basically no equipment. And then moving on from that, if you have some sort of a medicine ball, It would be great if you could throw it for distance, obviously, if you don't have a radar gun. But if you're just running out of distance, a way that you can do it if you have a high enough ceiling is just lie on your back and see how high you can do a medicine ball chest pass. Try to get it as high as you possibly can. If somebody else is next to you or something, see if you can mark height along a wall or maybe you can set up your phone set it up next to you and see how high that ball is going relative to a ceiling or something like that. It gets tricky. I, I get it. We were doing a lot of at home workouts for the first couple months of quarantine. And then we had to go back to at home uh, at the beginning of fall. So it's, it's been very hectic, but I will say like whenever you can make training sort of fun, make training a, uh, where you're giving some sort of measurement and trying to improve on that measurement, it makes training way, way more beneficial, in my opinion. Those are some that I would say are, are, are pretty good ones to start with. And then obviously, like the basic ones, you know, the pistol squats are great. Push-ups are great. Exercises like that. If you can do an inverted row, that would be awesome. Those exercises require minimal equipment, but they 
can be very effective too, obviously. Yeah, it's hard to create context at home, like you're saying, because so much time as, as a coach when you're in there with you is, is number one, just to get that intent, but also that feedback and, and that fun factor that you're talking about. So like you're saying, do the broad jumps for distance, give them a target. And then it makes it way much easier to to quantify and get the engagement. Home training is an interesting thing too, because maybe their parents can't drive them somewhere or they can't afford it or this or that, you know, potentially. But like, there's only so much you can do with like at home training. Like, I don't know, you feel like you have to get to a local gym or, or, or have access to equipment just to, especially because so many kids are forced to fishing. There's only so much you can do as a body weight, unless you want to do like isometrics, like put a towel under your leg for split squats and stuff and do isometrics and try to stand up and try to rip your towel basically. And then you get bored, right? And that's the whole factor of training, keeping training fun and engaging. You get bored, then you you, know, you don't try as hard and then you you lose progress. I believe in your book, you talked about how like the squat might be a little bit more correlated to like swing power and then your upper body strength kind of correlates a correlates well or better with maybe some of the exit velocity. So I guess maybe talk about through some of your, your favorite exercises or how, how the fact of like the, the, the squat transfers to the swing and then the, the importance of the upper body strength for, for, um, you know, improving exit velocity. I am kind of a perfect example of how a super, super big, strong dude who maybe doesn't have all the high velocity characteristics in the world but when you address them, your swing power goes through the roof. And that's what I've been doing this fall with like the golf swing training. I've been doing a lot of high velocity work and I've just been maintaining my squat, maintaining my deadlift to make sure that it's still in that 450 to 500 range. The numbers have been going through the roof for the golf swing. But what's interesting there is the guys who really struggle with squatting and deadlifting, they're the ones who's they stagnate the most when it comes to their swinging velocities. So I do think that there's something with lower body power metrics and lower body strength metrics that really does match up well with swinging. The upper body power metrics that we like to focus on are like the medicine ball shot put throw, the standing overhead throw with the medicine ball. Those are the ones that you're really going to want to improve in if you really want to improve your throwing velocity. So like it's good to have strong legs for throwing, but it's probably most important to have a super explosive upper body. That's at least what, from what I'm finding. And with swinging, it's a little bit different in that you can be a big donkey strong dude. And even if your upper body is not super explosive, you can still swing your implement super fast. So like, I know that's a big thing. Everyone wants to be explosive, right? That's just like the buzzword. How do I make my kid more explosive? Explosive first step, explosive this, that, right? Like we're talking about too, like through the force velocity profiling, in order to make you more explosive, it basically depends on what you need as an athlete, right? So it's like, if you're a big, strong dude, you just need the opposite. You need to do more explosive work, like explosive pushups, medicine ball throws, all stuff that we, you were referring to. And the same thing, vice versa. If you want to be more explosive and you're a very weak or the, you know, your strength is lacking, then the best way for you to get more explosive is to do more slower, heavy strength work and less like, you know, box jumps or whatever. I'm not saying that, that you don't, don't do box jumps, but like, you know, that stuff's going to help you more is getting your, getting your strength levels up. Yeah. hundred percent. And a great way to look at it too, from like a biological perspective, just think about it like this. If I have a muscle that has a ton of muscle fibers, it's very big and very dense. It's probably going to be very strong. But if the signal to that muscle is not very fast and those muscle fibers aren't good at contracting very fast, well, then that's your problem. You're velocity deficient. But if you're weak, you got no muscle here. You only have a little bit of muscle to, to tap into. So we need to make that bigger. We need to increase that motor unit threshold, that, that ability to recruit high threshold motor units will only happen if we're actually expanding on the number of type two muscle fibers that you have to work with. It really does come down to like, if you have nothing to pull from, then you're only going to improve this much at the power end of things. You have to get more in that bucket of strength in order to improve that explosive strength. A lot of eccentric work. So slowing on the way down, you know, we do, and again, it doesn't matter. You do it for every exercise, pull-ups, squats, you know, not so much deadlifts, but like lunges, you know, just slow tempo stuff that's going to help really help increase strength and obviously your uh, muscle mass for guys. So any other ways that you like mm -hmm. to do, um, I guess, strength training to get more muscle for baseball guys? Yeah. It, and, and so another way to kind of look at it too is look at how close you're getting to failure in a set, let's say. And so I'm very fortunate. I have a couple bar speed sensors here in the facility. 
And so if I have an athlete who they already have all the mass in the world, we're going to keep bar speeds and velocity loss really low. We're going to keep bar speeds really high over the course of their set. And by doing that, we're always going to have a high level of force production without trying to throw in too much of the excessive muscle fibers that might get in the way of that high velocity strength. But for most of those high school athletes that need to increase their size, uh, we're going to get a lot lo- like bigger velocity losses per set because that's going to get them closer to that, um, that sort of failure range. And that's going to trigger more hypertrophy type responses. You're fatiguing your type two X explosive fibers and not just like, you know, taking it every set to failure, right? Like you're being specific about which muscle fibers you're fatiguing. If you're a kid who is, you know, sort of on their own right now with strength training, and you, you really don't have the financial means to reach out to a coach and get a program and stuff like that, just try to find some sort of explosive measures that you know you can track, like a broad jump for distance, medicine ball throws for distance. Try to find something to improve on over the course of your program. It's going to make it so much more worthwhile, so much more fun, and you're going to make sure that you're held accountable to continuously improve in a metric that should match up well with improving that throwing velocity and swinging velocity that everybody wants to. If you can get outside, obviously, and sprint, like go to the field, walk to the field, walk outside, just just sprint. If you have a hill by your house, that's great. But more so even too, if you have a rock, like literally go outside, get like a, a light, medium, heavy rock and throw those things as far as you can, mark them, anything just to yeah, get you engaged and give you that instant feedback. That's the most powerful thing. So let's talk about like weighted balls. So Obviously, it's huge like with like driveline, all these everyone's doing weighted balls now program. So I'm sure you have a lot of questions. So any questions you might get from parents on weighted balls, what's your kind of stance on them? Obviously, I'm assuming there's a time and place for them. Have you even used weighted balls at all or recommend them or kind of guidelines? It is interesting. I would say everybody's a little bit unique. Like I'll have some college guys who never touch a weighted ball. They only throw the five ounce ball. The first thing that I like to get across to people is look, every ball that you throw has a weight. A football weighs 16 ounces. This ball weighs this. A, a baseball it weighs five ounces, but somebody just made up a baseball at some point. They had no scientific backing behind it this ball is the best for your throwing arm and blah, 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 blah. So there is no scientific backing behind a specific weight is the best for your child's arm. So laying that groundwork for the argument first is is very important that, you know, we can't just pick the five ounce ball as the perfect one uh, because that's what we've always thrown. Second of all, though, I would say if we know that we have to throw this five ounce ball in competition, Let's get the most out of this five ounce ball. It could take you years before you run into sort of a stagnation in progress where you hit that plateau where no longer is throwing this five ounce ball and doing all the strength training and the power work. No longer is throwing the five ounce ball with all of that going to increase anymore. So then maybe at age 17, 18, you run into that problem. That's when we start to introduce some of the seven and the six ounce balls. So I tried to keep them for the latest possible part of their development as I can. And if the seven and the six ounce balls aren't working, I have read quite a bit that says that the four and the three ounce balls are very, very beneficial, but also quite risky. They will elicit the most velocity, the most torque on the joints. So they can have a higher risk of injury with them. So hopefully by that point, you're 18, 19, 20 years old. You're a very big, strong dude that can handle those types of forces. That's when I would get into a lot of the light load velocity type exercises where you're doing the the run and guns with the four, the three ounce ball, the shuffle throws with the four ounce ball, stuff like that. That's when I want to get into it. So it's almost like you have to graduate the different levels. You start with the five ounce and all the strength training. You're going to see good progress for a while. Then we get into the seven and the six ounce ball. Then we get into the the underload ball. I have a guy who's 21 years old and his velocity just keeps going up with a baseball. Why would we try to give him any other stress, any other implement if he's making progress? You know what I mean? So try to do the least amount of the fancy stuff and most of the basic stuff until you stop making progress. That's the way that I approach it. I always like to have that analogy that stuck with me too, is like training is like, you know, like the tube of toothpaste, right? Like in the beginning, it's full. You can like squeeze it anywhere. Like, you know, toothpaste comes out, right? And then not till you get to the very end of the tube of the toothpaste, you're like rolling and crinkling and folding and trying to be creative ways to like get every little bit out. So it's basically like the underweight balls are even 
even more risky almost. Obviously, like that's kind of taken out of context. The stress going on, those joints, your glenohumeral, your obviously UCL. You, see, you don't want to just jump to things like you're saying if you don't have a good foundation, number one. But two, if you're just doing it randomly, right? If you just don't have really a reason to do it, to do it just because it's a hot thing. Yes, you hit the nail on the head, man. So like when you get to that age where it is appropriate to start doing a lot of the different weighted balls, you can just test each one. See which ball is your best ball. Are you better with the seven ounce than you are with the five ounce or the six ounce versus the five ounce? I've seen guys who throw the six ounce faster than the five ounce. So what that tells me is, they might be really good at producing force with this baseball, but maybe they need more velocity. Mm -hmm. So we'll start introducing the four ounce to them and see what happens. So it's a really good way to think about it. It all comes back to that force velocity profile again. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. And then, so I guess lastly, just wrapping up too. So I guess from your experience, what kind of results, because a lot of parents want to know what kind of results can I expect from my kid to or progress to be made? What kind of like how many miles per hour, you know, we just want the end result, right? Obviously depends on the kid's consistency, their ability to be coachable and execute what you give them. Mm -hmm. um, but like, I guess, what kind of some guidelines or kind of metrics you've seen, whether it's like you know, try to set the stage for like, hey, I, I want to try to get the guy like a 12 week program type of thing. I've actually been trying to like look at all the results that I've gotten over like the three, four years I've been doing this and try to see what's happening with the younger kids, like a 13 or 14 year old. I've seen huge jumps, like 10 to 12 miles per hour of exit velocity in a year, six to 10 miles per hour of throwing velocity in a year. Like I've seen really rapid results. It makes the most sense because they are the beginners. They are the ones with the most gains to be had, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that point, maybe ages like 15 to 16, we're looking at something a lot less, something like five miles per hour of improvement over the whole course of the year. They're still growing. So they are going to see results simply by, you know, natural growth processes. But I would say about five miles per hour of exit velocity, maybe three to four miles per hour over the course of a year. And then as they get a little bit older, now you're looking at the ranges where maybe their throwing velocity is only like that 80 to 82 mile per hour range. Maybe their exit velocity is like upper 80s at that point. So we're looking at trying to get them to that next threshold of maybe another two or three miles per hour in a year to get them into the mid 80s. And now you're looking at it over the course of an entire year. So if you break that down, you're gaining like one mile per hour every three or four months with these guys. So the progress is a lot slower. But so long as it's consistent, that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. If you look at the large scheme of things, let's say you're a kid who's 15 years old and you throw 70 miles per hour and you want to be a professional baseball player. So you know, you have to get to 95. If you have five years to do that, well, you have about maybe let's say you make about six or seven miles per hour improvement in your first year and you make another three or four in the next year. Now you're looking at a mid eighties guy. Now your goals are much more attainable. So now you maybe make two miles per hour of gains every year or so you're going to be creeping into that range of throwing mid nineties. So it's all about consistency over the years of development, not necessarily trying to gain 20 miles per hour in a year or something like that. I try to preach like one mile per hour every two to three months. If you can do that and you're a high schooler, you're on the right track. Something is working in your program. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, it's good. They just that feedback and like you're saying something that they have to look forward to and a target to, to obtain. So, uh, but like, like you're saying, a big thing that I personally ran into issues with is like the consistency part. So it's like, should kids be training in season? You know what I mean? Um, and then also how do you get them to maybe not commit, but like at least like be consistent all year round versus, you know, doing a 12 week program. And then what happens? Like you make all this progress for 12 weeks, baseball seasons. Okay. See you later. No more training. And then, you know what I mean? Then we just decline from there. And then when actually your performance should be increasing, because guess what? You don't want to be the best in the beginning of the season and then mellow out and get worse as, you know, when playoffs are happening, you know, a couple months down the road, especially with all the travel ball stuff going on nowadays. So I guess, so have you done anything to get them consistent? And also like, you know, I guess, how do you, how do you get the guys to do that? I'm very fortunate that I don't really have the issue of like guys who don't want to train. Like everybody I train personally loves the training part of the game too. So that's very good. But I would say really try to have those same metrics that we we're using in the off season for power and you know the medicine ball throw velocity and stuff like that. Keep doing it over the course of the season. And obviously you want to track other things too, like body weight. If body weight is going down over the season, 
Hey, you got to get your nutrition better. You got to find a way to sleep better. You have to do these things. And if you're holding them accountable with these numbers, then you know that you're going to keep them on the right track. So that's the way I like to do it. But as far as in-season training goes, man, a lot of the same stuff that we're doing in the, it's sort of like in the off season, maybe we'll cut out some of the high velocity work because they're already doing a lot of it in game. Yep. But a lot of the strength training is going to be the exact same, maybe just cut down the volume enough so that they're recovered fast enough for that when they play in their games, they're ready to go. So like you're saying, when they're in season, you can only need to maybe strength train like twice a week, not do too much like high speed stuff because that's what you're doing in practice and at games and in tournaments on the weekends. So you're kind of checking that box slightly. Like you just literally need like two, maybe 45 or two to three, 45 minutes hard strength lifts potentially. And then you're, you're good to go. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Hey, I appreciate you so much. So again, I'll put your links down below to like, you have your book called swing fast, obviously you can get, which I bought and was very grateful for. It's very practical, straight to the point. And also I think you have like a Patreon as well, or some coaching that, you know, how can people guess, get, best get in touch with you? Yeah. The Patreon is Bill Miller training. And um, yeah, basically what I like to do there is dive very deep into some of the Instagram posts that I have. You can find me on Instagram at Bill Miller training. Awesome, man. Well, hey, I'm going to end this and then, you know, we can go from there. So appreciate your time so much and, um, you know, hope you have a great rest of your day, my man.